Reagan, Clinton, Bush, a three-phase experiment. Have you wondered whatever happened to supply-side economics? This has been a Republican aspiration for four decades now and was promoted by four different presidents. So how did it all turn out? By now we should know the answer. So let's take a look. As you may remember, in 1981, Ronald Reagan introduced supply-side economics as a tax policy to achieve broad-based prosperity. The idea was straightforward. Cut taxes for job creators, which will stimulate corporate investment, which will lead to more jobs with better pay. The growing economy will generate more tax revenue, which will eliminate the federal deficit once and for all. As the money flows downstream, the rising tide will lift all boats. Sound familiar? In 1981, it was hard to know whether supply side would work. Reaganomics, as it became to be known, was, after all, just a theory, a prediction, an appealing idea that made sense. But that was nearly 40 years ago. By now, we have amassed the evidence to test the theory. Amazingly, the jury is in, and the facts are now clear. It is time to review the evidence. I am a physician. In my world, we must always base life or death decisions on reliable evidence, on solid facts. At the patient's bedside, there is no room for fake news. We call this approach evidence-based medicine. In this paradigm, we try to rise above all the explanations, theories, and predictions to just cut to the chase, to focus on the final outcome. In the end, that's all that matters, the actual impact of our treatment. And sometimes, when seeking an answer like this, a physician performs a three-phase trial. First, they administer the treatment to test its impact. This is the challenge. If it works, they take it away, the reversal, to see if the effect disappears. Then they introduce it a second time, the re-challenge, to restore the effect. Between these three phases, the challenge, the reversal, and the re-challenge, the true impact of a treatment is usually clear. This is a beautiful demonstration of the evidence-based approach. In the history of supply-side economics, we have the physician's dream, a natural experiment in three phases. Phase one was the Reagan challenge. Phase two was the Clinton reversal. Phase three was the Bush re-challenge. Our setting for reviewing this experiment will be a 40-year timeline of federal budget surpluses and deficits under seven recent presidents, starting with four years of moderate budget deficits under Jimmy Carter. In 1981, Reagan's first year in office, we got our first big dose of supply-side tax cuts in the Reagan Challenge. As we saw in my first video essay, Reaganomics explained, the first visible impact of the tax cuts was, disappointingly, a huge loss of government revenue and an immediate spike in the federal budget deficit, which quickly topped out at nearly $200 billion and remained unacceptably high for the next decade. The supply-side impact on the national debt was equally disappointing. While 39 presidents before him had accumulated about a trillion dollars of debt in total over two centuries, Reagan alone borrowed nearly twice as much as that entire amount, nearly tripling our national debt in just eight years. As a solution to Carter's modest budget deficits, Reaganomics was a miserable failure. As far as lifting the boats, it was hardly better. During Reagan's presidency, median incomes went up by less than 3% in total, and the lower half actually did slightly worse. The next experiment in our lineup was the reversal of Reaganomics by Bill Clinton in the Tax Act of 1993, which increased the top personal tax rate and raised the top corporate tax rate. In essence, Bill Clinton reversed supply-side economics by raising taxes for job creators. As you can imagine, Republicans howled. Tax increases are going to kill job creation. Tax increases are going to make the deficit worse. Tax increases are going to strangle the economy. So, what happened? Over eight years, Clinton's policies turned a $300 billion deficit into a $200 billion surplus. While Reagan's tax cuts had sent federal deficits spiraling out of control, Clinton's tax increases reined them in. For the first time in decades, our budget was in the black. What about the flip side, jobs growth? Did the Clinton tax increases suck the life out of job creation as predicted by supply side theory? Quite the opposite. During Clinton's eight years, nearly 23 million new jobs were created, an all-time record that still stands today. 
By the end of Clinton's term, the only fact-based conclusion was that tax cuts for the rich created record-breaking deficits while failing to reward the middle class, who completely missed out on our growing economy. Clinton's tax policies restored the balance while producing jobs in massive numbers. That should have been the end of supply side, but it was not. Enter George Bush Jr. In 2001 and 2003, believe it or not, he re-challenged us with two more rounds of supply side policy. Once again, we cut taxes for the wealthy. Once again, we borrowed the money. Within three years, the $200 billion budget surplus became a $400 billion deficit. But the wealthy got their due as the money flowed up the ladder and filled their pocketbooks. By 2006, corporate profits had tripled and a Wall Street boom had fueled subprime mortgages, credit default swaps, and massive speculation, leading to a colossal real estate bubble. Two years later, the bubble burst. By the end of Bush's second term, the economy was in tatters. The stock market had dropped by almost half. The automotive industry was nearing extinction. Jobs were disappearing at a rate of 700,000 per month, and the federal budget deficit had swelled to $1.1 trillion. So by January 2009, as Barack Obama prepared to take office, our three-phase experiment was complete, and the miserable performance of supply-side policy was in open view. So it is time to offer our conclusions. In summary, supply-side tax cuts severely expand the deficit and line the pockets of the wealthy. Rising corporate revenues do not seep down into workers' paychecks, they go to the owners. The hyper-stimulated economy enriches everyone at the top, leaving the middle class on the outside, and may even build a huge bubble that leads to a crash. This natural experiment is the convincing evidence we need to drop supply-side economics from our political vocabulary forever. Hi, I'm Nate Link, and I hope you were enlightened by this video essay on supply-side economics. Believe it or not, the theory was tested with yet another experiment. To learn more about this, go to snickersnack.com and tune into Obama vs. Trump, a two-part bonus round. Thank you.